And the earth is really not that old either, but that's another story. But people are denied there's a global flood, and that's what we see in the scientific community today. People deny the global flood. There's two worldviews. You've got the secular worldview, which tried to push God out of science. Back about the 19th century, geologists decided, we're going to push the writings of Moses out of science. And they purposefully decided to make up their own story. And they started throwing in the words like millions of years, because nobody can comprehend millions of years. So it becomes like monopoly money. And they just throw it around like it's real. And they found some techniques where they can tweak things and assume enough things that they can make the rocks look like they're millions of years old. But they're really not. Rocks don't really tell you how old they are. But that's another story as well. What the second world believes, and this is also in Second Peter, is everything continues as it always has. No beginning, no end. That's called uniformitarianism. I didn't put the big word up there, I don't think. But it means everything was uniform. They don't think there's ever a beginning or an end. Well, obviously they believe in a big bang. There had to be some sort of beginning. But they think everything on Earth has been going on the way it's been going on for billions of years. Volcanoes have always been volcanoes. Rivers have always been rivers. Everything they see, they try to explain in really slow processes. But again, they del deliberately forget and they're willingly ignorant of a global flood. And the evidence is there when you look at it. So the present is not the key of the past because the past had a catastrophic event called the flood. God tells us this in his, written in his own hand in Exodus 20. In the Ten Commandments, he handed to Moses. He said, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. He didn't say six great periods of time. He could have said six great periods of time, but he always used the word day, even in the creation week. He says the first day there was evening, there was morning. The second day there was evening, there was morning. You know, how long were those evenings and mornings if those were great periods of time? And so we believe these, the, the correct interpretation of the Hebrew shows that these are literal 24-hour type days. Maybe there was a few extra minutes on the day or something back then, or a few shorter minutes, we don't know. But literally in six days. And this gave us our work week. There's no astronomical reason for a work week other than God's plan for humans who he made differently than all the other animals because he made God in his image to reflect him. The secular ideas on the Ice Age don't really work. You hear this in school all the time. They, they repeat it enough times, they act like it's factual. They go with this Milankovitch theory we'll talk briefly about. Secular science has great difficulty explaining an Ice Age, and back in 1997, they admitted this is one of the great mysteries of science, and they had Milankovitch theory back then. It's still a great mystery, although they try to not admit that very often. They try to act like they know, and we've been seeing how science goes. Science has been really distorted this past year. But that's another matter as well. But science in general has been distorted because people are trying to push the writings of Moses, the Bible, out of science. And really what science does is confirms the Bible. Science confirms exactly what God said he did. And that's what I get to do. That's the, I get the greatest job in the world. I get to tell people God's word is true. You can believe every word of the Bible. There is no distortion in the Bible. God preserved it for us in this generation just like he provided other things for us in this generation. But this is the Milankovitch idea that they're supposed to wobble a little bit more, supposed to tilt a little bit more, supposed to go around the sun a little bit less circular every so often, every so many hundreds of thousands of years or 20,000 years or 40,000 years. And when those all coincide, of course, you get a really cold period of time called an ice age. Well, if you notice, those numbers are pretty small. They're not millions of years. You should have ice ages every couple million years. We should see ice age records all the way back throughout the whole rock record. But yet, even the secular community only believes in about five ice ages. And only one, the most current one that we believe really happened, it has really good evidence for it. So it's really only strong evidence for one ice age. And the, this theory should predict there should be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ice ages. Yet we don't see that in the rock record. So it doesn't quite work, but that's all they have. Just like they try to talk about the extinction of dinosaurs by saying it was, they're all killed by an asteroid. Not even all the paleontologists believe that, because it would have killed everything. And there's fossil frogs that go right across that boundary. Why didn't it kill all the frogs? Frogs are much more sensitive than dinosaurs to acid rain and all these other things they try to make up. So I examined that as well, and I showed, eh, there really might not even been an asteroid that hit that spot, but that's another story as well. But don't believe all these stories they tell you. They're telling you stories because they have to explain things outside the realm of what the Bible tells us and outside of science. So we're going to look at three things today before I get too carried away. How do we know there was an ice age? 
And some of you in Arizona go, ah, never saw it. My home state will see some. I'll talk about Michigan. What caused the Ice Age? And then finally, there's a biblical reason for the Ice Age. Some of you might have picked up on that already, but we'll see how it goes. So how do we know there was an Ice Age? Let's look at that. This is the ice coverage, approximately, in the Northern Hemisphere during the Ice Age. So all that was covered in ice, and the light blue was covered in sea ice. So on land, you're able to build up about a mile thick of ice, just like we see in Greenland today, what we see in Antarctica today. So in the Southern Hemisphere, there was also Ice Age, but there's not a lot of land down there, so there was mostly just Antarctica filled with ice. And so we still have Greenland and Antarctica as remnants of the Ice Age because it wasn't that long ago. And there has been global warming since the Ice Age, so that's not a new thing. And we'll see the sea levels have changed quite a bit. So it was really an Ice Age, and that's kind of the coverage we see. So my home state of Michigan's covered, but you notice Arizona's green. It's, there was no ice down here, so if you were here 4,000 years ago, that, no problem. It would have been cooler, though, and wetter, and probably no desert, really, at that point. Just like in Egypt, there was no desert at that point. It was a lot of rain. So people built civilizations, not in deserts, well, it's up here, but not in deserts in Egypt, but it was wet, a much cooler climate and a wetter climate for probably a few thousand years after the flood until it finally dried out and these deserts started to form as the earth cooled and, or warmed up and, and equilibrated. But my own home state, the Great Lakes, four of the five Great Lakes were carved by the ice. So after the flood, we left all these rocks out there and we'll see there's a reason it got cold, but it carved all these lakes. So four of the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron. I won't ask you which ones are which, because some of you might get them confused. But the most northern one, Lake Superior up there, has more water than all the rest. And it's actually a big fold, so it didn't really form by the ice. But uh, so we would have had one lake. It was the ice age. Oops, went the wrong way. Sorry. And these are the names. You can actually, they can actually map out these lobes that came down. You can kind of see the lakes now. The Erie, Huron Lobe, the Saginaw Lobe, where I'm kind of from that area in the thumb, kind of right in, the, right in between your thumb and your finger. That's where I'm from. And then the Michigan Lobe came down. Lakes, Lake Michigan to Chicago, and then Lake Superior Lobe. All these different lobes, they can map them out, and they can see that the lake levels fluctuated during the Ice Age because we can still see lake terraces, carved out lake, you know, beach surfaces almost, and so we know there was a level about 605 feet above sea level, a little higher than what we see today, that flooded a lot of Michigan. Then we see it drained off because as the ice was starting to melt back, the land started to rise again. The weight of the ice pushed down the land. And so as it started to rise, rebound, and it's still rebounding today in places, hundreds of feet since the Ice Age. And it tilted the land. It actually carved a gorge. See that little river that runs through, Mackinac River Gorge in the middle? It went down to several hundred feet. The water drained off really quick as it tilted. And the ice melted back and allowed the water to drain off. And so what happened, they had to build a bridge to span that gorge, because that gorge is several hundred feet deep. So to go from the lower peninsula to the upper peninsula or vice versa, you have to cross the Mackinac Bridge, which is the longest suspension bridge in, I guess, the Western Hemisphere. But most of you only hear about San Francisco. But uh, this is almost five miles long. So you can cross it, but they had to span with those two big spans, that big gorge in the middle. They couldn't build a causeway. And so this was built in the late 50s before I was born, uh, amazingly, and it's been working fine ever since. Sometimes the wind's so bad they shut it down for a day or two, but it works really well. And then the lakes dropped, rose again. They drained and they rose again because the ice was melting back. And this is the second lake level that we see evidence of in Michigan. So we see not only was ice there, but when it melted back, there was a couple of different lake levels. This is the Nipissing. These are named after native tribes, Algonquin and Nipissing in those areas. And then here's what we go to Michigan's biggest tourist trap, Mackinac Island. Anybody been to Mackinac Island? Here at Mackinac Island. See, you've been there. You've had the fudge. Let's see. Right by the Mackinac Bridge, you can take a ferry across, and you can see two different lake levels. There's an outer lake level where there's a cliff, and there's an upper lake level called the Ancient Island. And those are those two different lake levels that we were just talking about. In other places, you can see them as well. And so if you go to the area right here, that's supposed to be the Grand Hotel. Some of you have seen the pictures of the Grand Hotel. It's up on that first level. And so they've, Christopher Reeves made a movie about here, I think with Jane Seymour, called something with time. Uh, somewhere in time. Yeah, I knew it was something like that. And so you can go to the, I've never actually stayed there. It costs too much money. Uh, but you can go visit there if you pay some money. But it's on the first ridge, and there's a fort there as well. Then there's an ancient island up in the top, which is even the higher level. So we do see evidence of these lakes. 
and they can be explained by the Ice Age. That's the point of all this, even the Great Lakes themselves. And here's another level you can see down by the Mission Point Resort. You can see there's a cliff there. I kind of drew it out here in red. You can see that cliff. That's that same lower lake level as you go along. Well, you can go to the lower peninsula of Michigan, way up here in what we call like the little finger area of the... If you're from Michigan, just say I'm from here, here, and just use your hand. Arizona is tougher. I'm from, where am I from in Arizona? It's like Colorado and Wyoming. It's tougher to, to show. But you can see the evidence of these trends that follow those arrows. The ice actually followed that path. You can see the lakes actually follow that path. Those little lakes are actually the same direction as, as ice scoured the land and left behind remnants of things called drumlins. And you go up there and you can see these drumlins, these hills that built up under the ice which scientists still don't understand exactly how they form. But we see them in New York, we see them in Europe, we see them in uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, these hills that are about a half mile long and about 300 feet high of just debris, unsorted debris. And they grow different fruit trees on these because they have a different soil than the area in between up in this part of Michigan. Grow a lot of cherries up there, those very, very sweet cherries you guys like. You get them from Washington here, don't you? So yeah, Texas, it's the same way. It's a shame. But anyway, you can also go to the Upper Peninsula. You can, you can see scratches in the rocks, the bedrock surface in the Upper Peninsula. You see the big gouge that runs through there like a gully? At the bottom of the ice carry a lot of rocks, a lot of weight. Ice that was a mile thick is a lot of weight to it all. And you get erratics, rocks that are out of place. When I grew up, I got into geology because I would hoe beans in the fields in Michigan. We'd pick up fossils and rocks that were carried down by the glaciers hundreds of miles from further north. And you could pick these things up, and my brothers and I used to compete, try to find the best fossils. And I didn't know you could get a career out of geology, but uh, you can. But all these things are added up. In, in the 19th century in Europe, there was a, a European geologist who actually was the first person to really propose that there was an ice age. Nobody believed there was an ice age 150 years ago. They thought this is nonsense. But they started looking at these features in Europe and in North America, and they realized there really was an ice age. You know, all these landforms really do show up. Now, in Arizona, you don't see drumlins. You don't see you know, lakes and things like that. Uh, but these are all those moraines. Moraines are hills where the glaciers stopped for a while. And the ice was really dirty, filled with all sorts of debris and rock. And as it would melt, it would just drop off debris and build up a ridge. So these are these ridges where the ice was melting back at different times and stopped for a while. And you can kind of see these wormy looking maps. You can see how they followed the Great Lakes and scoured around. So look at the one up there in northern Michigan again. You can see the Mancelona area, a little bitty town where they grow potatoes. In between two hills, Port here on Moraine, there's a ridge here and there's a ridge to the south, but you can Google Earth, you can kind of see that ridge. And people in Michigan ski on these ridges. They're only maybe four or 500 feet high, but that's all we have. We have a lot of snow, and we have little hills. And most of the hills are moraines that are made by the glaciers as they melted. Glaciers never retreat. They're like George, General George Patton. They never retreat. They just melt back. They're always advancing from the thick ice which is up in Hudson Bay area in Canada. And just like if you drop you know, a bunch of water on the ground here, spill a bunch of paint, it's going to spread out. Well, ice tries to spread out too, but it doesn't flow as fast as water. And so you keep adding more ice, more ice, more ice. In the middle, it keeps trying to spread and flow out to the edges. And Michigan was at the edge. The southern edge was flowing to the south. So it kept building and building, moving the ice along. And so a Michigan state fossil is the mastodon, because south of these ice sheets, there are lots of mastodons. Well, how did the mastodons get there? If there was a global flood, how did mastodons get to Michigan? How did mastodons get to Texas and mammoths in Florida? During the Ice Age, all these huge woolly mammoths were living all around the United States. I don't know what was here. You guys have any fossil Ice Age critters like this? And so they lived most of the United States. It was much cooler and wetter at the time. So they could live here and not get a suntan. But the, they grew a lot of hair because they sensed the climate was cooler, so God built inside. Dr. Galuza, my, my boss, talks about the God designed these animals to adapt to the environment. So if the environment was cooler, their internal sensors kick in and they grew hair and they got big. So many of the animals in the Ice Age were very, very big as well because bigger retains more heat. You have less surface area for volume and it's a math thing. And so you can actually, the bigger you were, the more you can retain your heat. So the animals got really big. We had beavers that were this big during the Ice Age. Big, huge, human-sized beavers. And mastodons and mammoths were really big and plentiful. And rhinos had hair, all that kind of stuff. 
So we know there was an ice age now. After 150 years, scientists finally admitted there was an ice age. They try to say there's a bunch more, but there's really only strong evidence for this last one. And we only believe there was one ice age as creationists. So what caused the ice age? Well, that was the flood. But let me explain in more detail what the cause was, and uh, we'll see what happens. First thing you need is this. You need cooler summers. So you need 88 degrees instead of 100, like you're getting today. Well, maybe cooler than that. But you need a lot of cool summers, and you need a lot of snowfall, because snow makes ice. If you're going to build up ice, you've got to have a lot of snow. And the way glaciers build up is you get snow that doesn't melt from year to year, and you keep adding more snow the next year, more snow the next year, more snow the next year. So you need a tremendous amount of snowfall in a short amount of time, and you need cooler summers. And the flood gave us both those conditions, as we'll see here just in a minute. So what did the flood do? Well, the flood created a lot of volcanoes. A lot of volcanoes are erupting all over the Earth. We believe in what's something called catastrophic plate tectonics. We believe the plates move very rapidly during the flood year, particularly the latter half of the flood year. They were just humming along. The plates are moving meters per second, which is yards per second to you and me. You know, several miles per hour, not as slow. Like today, we see the plates moving about this far per year because everything's used up. They've consumed the original ocean crust, and once that was gone, there was no difference in density to speak of, and so everything kind of stopped. So today, we're at the point where everything's kind of stopped, but they're still moving. It's hard to stop massive plates that are 60 miles thick, and so they're all still kind of wiggling around a little bit, causing earthquakes, causing some occasional volcanoes, but at the end of the flood, we see in the rocks evidence that the volcanoes were all peaking. All over the earth, they're all erupting at the same time, hundreds of volcanoes going off, and they're a special type of volcano that was very explosive. These subduction zone volcanoes where you're pushing part of the earth's crust back in the earth creates a special chemistry that's very explosive. And so you needed the subduction to make volcanoes to blow up aerosols and ash into the sky. And what happens to those aerosols is it blocks the sun. So when we have volcanoes today, like Mount Pinatubo in 1991, that erupt. You guys don't feel it here in Arizona, but when I was in Michigan, going back from my PhD, it got down to 35 below zero. And in southern Michigan, it never gets that cold. That's, you know, that's North Dakota cold. It normally gets down to 10 below at the very coldest, but it was getting down to 35 below the year after Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines because it blew enough ash into the sky. So we got a couple years of cooling from one volcano. And the volcanoes in the past were super volcanoes, many of them, like Yellowstone, at the end of the flood. They were putting all sorts of aerosol up, and so the sky must have been really beautiful because you get really pretty sunsets when there's more ash in the sky. And, but we don't know. The Bible doesn't say anything about that, but it does talk about ice and snow in the book of Job. We'll talk about that a little later. So Mount St. Helens didn't even do much. Mount St. Helens erupted, left a lot of ash, but didn't even cool the earth. But these other volcanoes about a century before did. Tambora, 1815, is known as the year without a summer in Europe. It never warmed up. It stayed cold pretty much all summer long. And one of these volcanoes went up. I don't know if it was that year or not, but Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein because she was stuck inside. So she started making up stories. And so she wrote Frankenstein because of a volcano they'd erupted in the Philipp you know, over in Indonesia because it was one of those years without a summer again. And so you get global temperatures cooling down, you know, 1.2 degrees C, which is a couple degrees Fahrenheit to you and me. And Pinatubo erupted again. Very small amount, just a half degree C, but it really froze us up in the north. And so that's where the ice was forming, was in the north. The snow was coming down in the north. It didn't snow as much down here, probably at all. It just rained down here. In the Middle East, where they got off the ark, it was mostly rainy. Maybe it snowed a little bit, but it melted off. It wasn't as far north. And so they didn't have to suffer through ice sheets coming through what's now Iraq and Babylon, those areas. But it cools the earth. And this is what I see in the rock record. This is a part of my research that I've been working on for, this is, I think, four continents worth of data. And you can see the, the rock record progresses from the earliest rocks over here on the left-hand side. You see it's very small because there wasn't a lot of rock being deposited early. The flood was progressive, just like Genesis 7 talks about. And you see it peaks in that fifth sequence. That's about the end of the Cretaceous. You can see the rocks go way up, and then they come back down a little bit during the receding phase. But you see at the bottom down here, the red. The red represents volcanic activity. You see the red increases. You see just a smidgen at the bottom of the Cascassi, that third one, and then you see a little more, and you see a little more, and you see a little more. And it gets greater every time. 
That was by design. As you had more plate movement, you got more volcanoes erupting, more volcanoes erupting, put more aerosols up, more aerosols up, cools the earth. Cools even, you know, the equator, but not as much. But cools the areas far north and far south, got lots and lots of ice, lots and lots of snow coming down. So the rocks really do support this interpretation. This is Mount St. Helens in red. See how small it was? The ash from that was very minimal. But these other eruptions, the blue and the green, and things are things from Yellowstone. They erupted during the receding phase of the flood in what's called the Eocene rocks. Tremendous amount of volcanic activity. And they try to scare kids today, saying volcanoes, super volcano Yellowstone could erupt again. It could do this all over again and kill half the earth, including Arizona. Well, it probably would. But it's not going to happen again because that happened during the flood. So there's still residual volcanic activity today, but we don't see super volcanoes erupting like we did. Uh, those are flood events. And I think God had those erupt only during the flood when everybody was protected on the ark still. And so we didn't have to worry about that going on. So don't let the news media and the scientific community scare you because they have a secular worldview. They don't believe God's in charge. They don't believe God's in control. They don't believe God's word. They don't believe there was a flood. They don't believe the conditions of the flood were set up. So here's an artist's rendition of a supervolcano erupting, of course, and it would destroy half the United States if Yellowstone did erupt again, probably, but it won't. This is what's been happening since the flood. Volcanic activity has been diminishing. We see it peaks at the end of the flood, then the receding phase, and then for the next few hundred years, it was probably a lot of volcanic activity, hundreds of volcanoes going off simultaneously, and then it started to wane. And so today we get St. Vincent erupting, or we get Mount St. Helens erupting, or we get some other volcano in Costa Rica erupting, but we don't see lots and lots of volcanic activity all at once. So now that you guys are asleep, we're going to get to the good stuff. Are you guys staying awake somewhat? So again, spikes of volcanic activity replenish the aerosols. You keep putting up, putting up more ash, putting up more ash. You're going to keep the earth cool for hundreds of years. It's cool as summer for so many years, keep the snow from melting. Well, how do you get all that snow? You need a lot of snow, too, to build up ice. Well, we need snow. All you have to do is heat the water up. Hotter water evaporates faster. You guys find that out in your pools. I flew into Phoenix. I'm like, why do people have pools? Doesn't that just evaporate? <laughs> you know, like Lake Mead. A lot of it evaporates. We lose a lot of water that we could be drinking if they'd cover that. <laughs> it would help. I don't understand it. But I forget how much water they lose. I forget the number, but it's a tremendous amount of water because it's in a desert environment. And so you see the bathtub ring around there. So the bathtub ring, we see that in the rocks too. That's another story. But you have to have hotter water because the water got hot during the flood. If the water's hot, it's going to evaporate more. You're going to get more rain and in the north. You're going to get more snow. And so what we did during the flood, what God did, what we see God did, is he made a whole new seafloor out of lava. So that catastrophic plate tectonic activity I talked about, rapid movement, which John Baumgartner has shown with mathematics and one of the most powerful supercomputer processing these ever happened in the 90s when we worked for the government. And no one has refuted his numbers. No one has said his error. He had a, you know, a plus mine wrong or a minus sign wrong. No one has refuted his data and has shown that the crust really would run away and form really, really rapid plates and make a whole new sea floor in a short amount of time. The secular world just ignores them because it goes against what they try to say, that everything moves slow. They just project what we see today, this much movement, into the past and say, oh, it took millions of years. But in reality, you can form this amount of crust really, really quickly, and there's, there's rock support of that. Pastor Smedley and I were talking about earlier. There's actually melted rock in places where there's subduction zone, and it moved so fast it melted the rock. And you can see that it really did move fast. So all that seafloor, the red is the youngest, the green is older, the blue is the oldest of all, all happened really, really quickly. And all that's from lava. Lava's going to put, you know, as it cools, it's going to put a lot of heat into the water. So we have all this water that got heat, heated up to maybe 20 degrees Celsius hotter than it is today. These are some computer models people put forth. And you reached a glacial maximum maybe about 500 years after the flood. Because that's when everything was coinciding. You had lots of hot water still pumping out moisture, coming down as snow. And eventually, within a couple hundred years, you started building up ice. And by about 500 years, you probably had a maximum ice sheets all over the world very, very quickly. Surprisingly fast when you show the computer models. This can happen really, really quick. And then it probably faded away because the oceans eventually cooled down to where they are today. Within about 2,000 years after the flood, you're pretty much at where we are today. 
and that caused the rain to slow down. And it caused the snow to slow down. And it caused Egypt to dry out. It caused Arizona to dry out and become deserts. And the Sahara to become a desert. But up for maybe the first couple thousand years, through the time of the patriarchs and everybody else. Remember Moses? Probably would have been along about that time. Well, maybe not Moses, but for sure Job. Well, there's evidence of warmer oceans because humans were traveling around the coast. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. But there's evidence of the edges of the continents didn't have any ice because the edges were so close to the oceans that they stayed warm from the ocean water. The ocean water can moderate the temperature. So England in the UK today stays warmer even though it's way far north because that warm Gulf Stream water kind of moderates the temperature. So if you're near a large body of water, like in Michigan, where I was about 10 degrees warmer than Wisconsin because we have the lakes that warms the air masses. And so I don't know how people in Wisconsin live. They have to wear cheese in their heads, I found out. You ever seen that? They wear cheese in their heads to stay warm. And so we don't do that in Michigan. You know, we have a team that never wins anything. And so it's a curse. It's a curse, I tell you. To grow up in... Anyway, the oceans were warmer. And so along the coast, they actually found barefoot human footprints in the Ice Age Pleistocene sediments. They weren't even wearing shoes. It was so warm. And we see this in other places in the world. It's not Bigfoot. Those are normal-sized human footprints in the mud. There's a whole bunch of them in this area right off the coast of Canada in one of these little islands during the Ice Age because it was so warm. The water was still so warm. It was like bathtub water. And inland, 50, 100 miles, you're starting to build up ice, but along the coast, it stayed really warm. So you could walk along the coast, go from Alaska down. It was, would have been really nice along the coast, but inland, it was a lot of snow. So finally, because you're waiting for this, the biblical reason for the Ice Age. There's a biblical reason for the Ice Age. God had a plan. Just like he had a plan for me, I didn't know what it was. I was 52, like I said, before I knew God's plan. I kept thinking, God, it's got to want me to do something else. And then, sure enough, it happened. Like a lightning bolt. I get the job at ICR, and then I realized, this is God's plan. So God's got a plan for you guys, too. And some of you might work along, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. Maybe you're doing God's plan right now. I don't think I was, but I was getting trained for it. And I was sinful as the next, worse than many of you. And, but God still used me. He uses broken people. If you turn to him, he uses broken people. He brings you back, gives you a second chance. So God gave me a second chance, and I'm, I'm trying to use it to its fullest to show people there really was a truth to the Bible. But there's a biblical reason for the Ice Age. And we'll see what that is here in just a minute. This is, gets going. All right, let's look at a timeline, because you guys like number lines. Who doesn't like a number line? It's like a timeline. So here we are. The flood happened, according to the genealogies, about 2349 B.C., so that's 4329 plus 21. I can't do the math. Don't do math in public, but you can add up in, in your notes. And then around 2000 B.C. or so, you know, was the birth of Abram, who became Abraham, you know, the most scholars think around 2000 B.C. So you're looking at just you know, a few hundred years after the flood ended, within maybe 350 years. And the ice might have reached its maximum just after that, maybe 500 years, as I mentioned earlier. So they were, you know, Abram and Job, possibly, were right in smack dab in the middle of the ice age. But they weren't living in ice, because they were living far enough south. But it was colder and rainier and wetter. And so in the book of Job, if you read through the book of Job, and you can read out there in the wall. I'm really impressed with that. I can't get over that. The Bible right there, stainless steel. You guys have a unique thing. Nothing else in the world has that that I've ever seen. I don't know. Maybe. But if you read the book of Job, there's more references to snow and ice than any other book of the Bible. This is possibly one of the oldest books of the Bible, written around the time of Abraham or Abraham, or a reference to Job, but he lived about then. Patriarchs. So there was evidence of a lot of rain, a lot of snow, but I guess ice would have been to the north. But here's, again, the trickiest graph of all. It's kind of two graphs in one, but the important thing is sea level would have been 395 feet lower during the peak of the Ice Age. So sea level would have been lower because you suck up all the ocean water into ice. So if you made all this ice, it's evaporating, it's coming down as ice, coming down as snow and ice, snow and ice, snow and ice. Eventually, you melt all these big ice sheets like Greenland, Antarctica, across northern Europe, across northern Asia, 
across northern North America, and you drop sea level. And this is the secular numbers over here on the side, that little white graph showing how it rose 120 meters, which is about 395 feet since the peak of the Ice Age. And of course, they say it was 22,000 years ago, but we think those are, numbers are inflated. But basically, as the ocean water cooled and the volcano slowed down, everything started to equilibrate, and the Ice Age started to disappear. So you reached about a maximum of 500 years, and maybe within 700 years, the ice was gone. Ice can melt really quick if it warms up, and you stop adding more snow in great amounts. And so what happens is today we've kind of settled out at this kind of steady pace with fluctuations up and down, a little bit of global temperatures going up and down, but essentially we've had all this global warming, and the sea level, most of the sea level rise already occurred. But there was a moment in there of a couple hundred years, a window of opportunity when you could walk from continent to continent. All this brown was land. If you drop sea level 120 meters or 395 feet to you and me. See, if you run enough 5Ks, you'll learn the metric system. I used to tell my students, run 5Ks, and you'll learn how far a meter is. But all that brown would have been dry land during the ice age. And again, they put ice up to the coast. They don't believe the ocean was warm, but the footprints tell us the ocean at the edge was warm, there was no ice at the edge. There was very little ice on the edges. But all that area in the north was all covered in ice. A little South America, too. You can see the mountains mostly in Antarctica that went out. But you could walk across from, well, we'll get to back to that in a minute. You could, let me go back. You could walk across from Asia, of course, to North America. You could walk to any continent. Just walk. Animals could walk. That's how the mastodons got here. They walked. They got off the ark, and they walked here. It took them centuries, maybe, but God had a timing plan that was just perfect. Several hundred years after the flood, you peak in ice just as the animals are getting to the edge of Asia. And suddenly they get across in that maybe two, three hundred years window of opportunity when there was really warm water and there was dry land. They could just walk right across. God had a plan all along. And so what were humans doing? What did Nimrod say? Let's stay here in the plains of Shinar and build a city to ourselves and build a great tower and disobey when God said, spread out. He said, fill the earth. The animals were filling the earth, but humans were disobeying and they were staying right away within a few hundred years after the flood, maybe 200 years after the flood, humans were already disobeying because most of them were, the new people that were born, of course, never saw the flood. They heard about it because the guys were still alive. Seth was still alive. He could have told them. They built this Tower of Babel, probably a step pyramid type thing. Disobedience and dispersal. So eventually God had to step in and confound the languages to get people to spread out. Because if you can't understand somebody, you get annoyed and you finally leave. And so everybody got annoyed with each other and they all left. And then they went into caves for a while, temporary housing. There were no cavemen, there was just temporary housing as they were traveling to get away. And they went back to Stone Age technologies because that's all they had. You know, they didn't have a bunch of metal to go with them, so they had to use stone tools for a long time. And many cultures forgot how to do anything else, and they stayed stone cultures for thousands of years, even up until today, because the stone tools work really well. But in the pre-flood world, they were using metals, the Bible tells us. They were using metals afterwards. Civilization came back pretty quickly, but others lived off the land for many, many years, including most of the people in North America. But you could walk across. Now, this is a secular timing map, but to me it's amazing how it matches exactly what the Bible says. Notice everything comes from the area just south of Turkey. I didn't draw this. These, those years are wrong. But look where everything comes from. Everything comes from right there, right smack, right up there, right south of Turkey, right from the plains of Shinar. I, a biblical... Interpretation is couldn't be any better except for the years. But you can see they walked right across. They walked across all these areas. You could just walk. But you had a small window when you could do it. And if you weren't going to get there, and the humans were disobeying, they weren't going to get there. If they stuck around the plains of Shinar, there'd be no humans in North America. When Columbus came across, there'd be nobody here but animals. And God said to fill the earth, and so finally they had to fill the earth, and they did walk across with those couple windows and so you could walk right across from Siberia into North America, called, across an area called Beringia. 
during the peak of the ice age, but it was only going to be there for a couple hundred years. Then the ice would melt, the conditions for the ice age, the oceans would cool down, the volcanoes would slow down, getting ready for the post-flood world, but God had to have a plan to get the animals on all these distant continents. God had to have a plan to get humans before we could take boats to all these distant worlds. It's a lot easier to walk than it is to fly when you didn't have a plane yet. You didn't have a plane yet, but we can now, or boats. And you could walk right across from France to Ireland. You drop sea level 395 feet. This was all dry land during the Ice Age. So people and animals got over to Ireland and Scotland and all these different places. The only place you couldn't get to was a little bit, there's a little bit of water between the islands over there to get to Australia. So to get to Australia, you had to hop. <laughs> well, kangaroos can swim, so they swam across. And the, a lot of the predators that killed off the kangaroos in Asia, we do see curry paintings of kangaroos in India, they just found recently. Uh, the kangaroos had to come across Asia. The marsupials that had come across Asia, but I think God had a plan for Australia to keep it separated by water so that some of these really unique animals could survive so we can still see them today. That there'd be no koala bears because they're easily killed by predators. But in Australia, there's no lions and tigers and bears. They didn't swim across the water. And so you have a very unique ecosystem in Australia. It's not that they evolved there. That's what ended up there. That's what survived there. The other animals didn't make it. And so some animals swam across, but, you know, if this was happening in World War II, Hitler would have won. God's plan, his timing, everything is perfect. We just think that, you know, in our own busy lives, we don't see God's hand in everything that happens. God is in control of everything. Pastor Smedley's book is reminding me about that. I was reading his book, Wait. He talks about that. He, everything is in his control. He stopped Hitler's armies. In World War II, I was reading a book about that, that Dunkirk. He stopped the tanks. And they, to, to this day, they can't explain why they stopped. The German high command said, stop. <laughs> Hung up the phone. They're like, why stop? We could surround them. The British would never have got to Dunkirk. They could have had them completely surrounded and captured the entire army. But the German high command said, for some reason, they called up and said, stop your tanks. We've got to arrest the tanks. Because they were still thinking like cavalry soldiers. But that's God's hand. God's hand allowed those guys to get away, get, to get to Dunkirk. And then miraculously, of course, the 300 and some thousand troops were able to be saved because they need those troops later. But why did the Germans step there? You know, that's, those, those moments like that we see throughout history and in our daily lives, God's hand is there protecting us. My daughter was living in El Paso. She moved a new, uh, out of El Paso about three or four days, I think it was, less than a week before that shooting at Walmart. And she used to go to that Walmart all the time because that was the area where she lived. And I said, that's God's hand. He protected you. You might have been killed that day, but he got you out of there. And she's in Colorado now. But you know, God prevents you from getting killed on the highways around here. He's got a plan for you. You're around for a reason. He wants to use you to tell others about Christ, of God. You know, the ark was there. I won't get a chance to talk about this, but the ark was there for Decades, Moses, or Moses, Noah preached, Noah preached, Noah preached, yet only eight people got on the ark, his immediate family. All the other people on earth, maybe a billion people, died in the flood because humans were so wicked, God decided to judge the earth. But he provided salvation if they only believed enough to walk through the door. You know, like, well, maybe I'll take a chance at it, let me give it, you know, nobody even did that. It was just Mo and Noah and his immediate family, eight people got on. And today, God himself came into the earth. He came down, took on human form, allowed himself to be killed in a horrific death, die on this cross. God himself, who created everything, who could snap his fingers and destroy everybody, could have created everything instantaneously, but he gave us our work week by going out six days of it. Came down and died, shed his blood, but conquered death. He rose again three days later, just like he said he would. And that was predicted back in the Bible. When they would step on the, when Eve's descendants would step on the snake's head and conquer Satan. So God was victorious. Jesus was victorious. But he opened that door of salvation for us. He's that open door today. 
we can all get eternal salvation by believing in him. People at the time of the flood just had to walk through the door to get salvation. But that was just physical salvation. We can get eternal spiritual and physical salvation. Ultimately, our bodies will be restored. All we have to do is believe. Believe in, in the life-saving blood of Jesus. But let's finish this up here and we'll get move on. There's actually evidence that this land was dry because they found in these sand ridges offshore between the Netherlands and the UK, they found actually submerged settlements out there that were drowned. So what did people do when sea level rose? They moved. Today, we just move back. Sea level's going to rise 10 feet in the next century, or I don't think it'll be that much, a couple feet. People just move back. Or they build walls like in New Orleans. And hope it holds. Kind of worries me. I used to live down there. It's kind of, we didn't live in New Orleans. I worked in New Orleans, but I lived above sea level, knowing that a hurricane could come, and sure enough, it did. And it, there'll just be another hurricane. But, but there is scientific evidence. You, know, you can look at the landforms. There really was an ice age that took place a few thousand years ago. The ice age, though, the conditions for it were caused by the flood. It was a one-time ice age because it was a one-time global flood. But it was a necessary ice age to allow animals and humans to get to all these distant continents. You land in one spot near Turkey, how do you get everything back? God had a plan. God has a plan for all of us. He had a plan to save humans. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, he had a plan. He was going to step in through the descendants of Abraham. And he did as Jesus. He came. He's going to come again. He's going to judge the earth again. And we can be saved from that judgment through his blood by accepting him as our Lord and Savior. But the ice age was necessary for dispersal. It says in Isaiah 55, 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. I get the pleasure as a scientist to see this much of God's wisdom and see a little bit of what God had planned. And it's just an amazing thing as a scientist to see that God had a plan, that God did these things, he provided these things, he provided these resources we use today like oil and coal in the flood. In the conditions of the flood, he buried all this organic material, knowing that we would need that at this generation for our energy uses that we're doing now. Neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He also gave us an escape from the coming judgment through Jesus, through that open door. God himself, who created everything from nothing, spoke it into existence, decided he loved us that much. I didn't realize what unconditional love was till I had kids. Some of your parents know. Your kids are like, yeah, I don't know about that. But once you have kids, you realize it's unconditional. You love them no matter what. God loves us no matter what. But we have to come to him. You know, he calls us. We have to respond. We have to go through that door. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while I was still a sinner, I still had that sinful nature, but Christ died for us. More than that, being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. So we'll be, there was an earlier judgment of the flood. There'll be another judgment coming later as well. But we can be saved from that wrath, it says in Romans 5. In the back, uh, this has nothing to do with the Ice Age, but there's a chapter in the Ice Age in it. This is my book that just came out last year in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but it covers the flood evidence over three continents. And one of the chapters at the end of the flood, of course, is the Ice Age. It talks about the history of the Ice Age, why there was an Ice Age. A little bit longer version of what I talked about today, but again, it all comes down to God had a plan. And his timing is perfect. The Ice Age is very, very important to end the flood. And so if you want to know more about this, I, I do feel bad it's only 496 pages. I didn't get those last four pages in there. And so I've got to write a new one that covers the rest of the world. I'm almost done with a couple more continents since then, but it's showing the same story. That's where those graphs came from. And then there's a new book out by my colleague, Jay Kiebert, who studied his physics degree was in climate physics. And he has, you know, if you're worried about varves, worried about ice cores, worried about the ASH, a lot of what I said today, you know, he's been working on, but he has more details than I can give you on those things. Those varves, varves don't happen every year. Ice doesn't happen every year. You get a storm, you get another line. So all you need is a bunch of storms. It doesn't take thousands of years, it just takes thousands of storms. So ice doesn't really, you got to get the idea out of your head of one, one tree ring one year, because even tree rings can form two and three in a year. 
depending on the droughts and the conditions. And they know this. Scientists know this. But they still try to shove it down you. Oh, these can't be young because there's all these layers. But he talks a lot about that in greater detail than, than I can tell you. But uh, get out of your head the idea of a var being one year and a tree ring being one year all the time. And especially this ice cores, those layers in the ice cores being one year. And this is a new and revamped book since I've been here a couple years ago. We did this one in 2020. So we were busy during the COVID lockdown, rewriting books and writing books and working all these things. And the Creation Basics and Beyond book, I recommend, if you don't buy any other book that I bring brought with me, this is the book I would get. If you're going to school, high school or college, you're going off to a Christian college even, they may not teach what the Bible really says. They may teach evolution. A lot of Christian schools now teach evolution. They teach older stuff. These are the books that are going to get you through it. So if you don't buy any, it's only $10. We should charge 20 for this book. But it's only $10. I don't understand why it's so much. I use this in my college class. I teach a science class for a local Christian college in South Lake, Texas, called the King's University. We do their science class where I get the pleasure of doing that. And we use this to supplement their secular text. You know, the secular text is talking about millions of years and billions of years and all these other things. And there's good science in there, but you've got to weed through it. This will keep you grounded. This book will, there's short little chapters on everything, including the Ice Age, dinosaurs, all sorts of stuff. So my colleague, Frank Sherwin, always says, if you would buy one book, I'd buy these four. <laughs> but this really is four books in one. You know, the Carbon Stone book, for those of you interested in the geology hardcore, but this is the best book, I think, that we offer for the value. And then this is the, probably the second greatest book ever written. And uh, we'll talk about this more tonight. After... Well, okay, it's third, maybe, because you've got the Bible, then you've got Pastor Smedley's weight, and then this book comes along. And then the Carbon of Stones, maybe fourth, but this is really well illustrated. If you look at a chance, this, you know, it's, it's worth it for the pictures. Th Three-year-olds will look at this book for a half an hour straight because they've seen it, because the pictures are so good. And the information in it is good for, like, high school, junior high, high school, and for parents and grandparents who are like, I don't know, were dinosaurs in the ark? in the book. How do dinosaurs go extinct? It's in the book. You guys ever wonder about that? Were they in the ark? Of course they were. The word dinosaur is not in the Bible. I'll talk about tonight because the word dinosaur didn't get it coined until 1841. So you're not going to see the word dinosaur if it wasn't invented yet. But you see Leviathan, you see behemoth, you see dragons. Those are probably all dinosaurs after the flood. They survived for a while. They eventually went extinct. You don't see them roaming Arizona, but you see Elam monsters, right? Elam monsters on there? <laughs> They're not really dinosaurs. We'll talk about that more tonight, but that's another good resource. And then my wife and I wrote this because she's a kindergarten teacher, and she says, even at a Christian school she taught at, they had millions of years in the books because there's no Christian books. This is a story you can read to three to seven-year-olds, or they can read it themselves. It's a story about Henry the Hadrosaur. So he a, he's in the middle there, and his two sisters are on the side because they have big eyelashes. Ironically enough, most girls have shorter eyelashes than guys, but I don't know why that is, but that's how I do it. Anyway, it's a story about him and how God had a plan for him based on Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, God even has plans for the animals. And even though they talk and they meet different dinosaurs, there's some biblical facts in there, there's some dinosaur facts in there, and it's a, it's, it's a story. You know, a lot of our books are just facts. Well, this is a story you can read. We have another one coming out probably at the end of this year, the second in the series of three of Henry the Hadrosaur, the duck-billed dinosaur. And again, if you don't have $10 to buy the Creation Basics or $40 to buy this book or that book, this is free. This is our gift to you. So sign up. We don't give your name to anybody else. You get the free monthly acts and facts. And every three months, you get the little devotional. And there's free copies of those out there in the back as well. Uh, but this is totally free. It's our gift to you guys for s enduring this talk. And suffering through, and some of you are going, eh, this guy's nuts, but we'll talk later. But God's, if you don't remember anything else, God had a plan. So the end, the, you know, you get, if you're going to end up in one spot in the world, how are you going to get everything back? He had a plan. And that's what the Ice Age was for. The Ice Age was to lower sea levels, soak up enough ocean water into ice sheets that you could drop sea level enough that you could walk almost anywhere. But it was only temporary. With that, I'll turn it back over to Pastor Yates, thank you very much.